and we had these uh, 120 uh, software packages arranged in a nice layer. And uh, we try to um, put them together in a way that gets the functionality of the big data stack and the performance of HPC. And at the end of this talk, I'll show you some performance numbers. And I think I showed you this slide in the first talk. This is just a, a simple list of the names of the software packages in that stack arranged in layers. You don't need to look at all of them. And so maybe you'd want to look at these, which is um, probably around 20 packages to do most things. And the almost last slide in this set just tries to use this um, hourglass-like uh, shape to show how um, you can have the, the system, which is at the top. It has various key characteristics, like uh, yarn for resource management and uh, scalable um, parallel programming with high performance communication and support for iteration. That's the R glass in the middle. You have um, application abstractions, graphs, networks, images, geospatial, key value. And that allows you to build these high-performance libraries. And this says essentially the same idea. Um, we have the performance of HPC, the functionality of Apache. We have the key system components. And then we have the application abstractions at the bottom. All right, so that's just background. So I wanted to sort of follow on from what Paul discussed and describe how to um, um, automate the building of big systems. And so if you look at those, um, that stack or any other related stack, you see that you need to be able to deploy a lot of services. That's what you're doing at the moment in your projects. And it will be good to do that deployment in the most automated fashion possible. And that automation allows you to do many things. It allows you to deploy the same service on different infrastructures, as long as you specify the service as an abstract fashion. It allows you to do what Paul described, um, do reproducible computing, because you've defined what you're doing. And um, so, so the key idea, which is not my idea, this is a generally understood idea, is software-defined distributed systems. A more common, a more common idea, which is closely related, is sort of software-defined networks. But um, you can think of doing software definition. And actually, software definition really means a scripting definition for the whole system. So what we're going to be discussing is uh, trying to see how far we can take software-defined distributed systems. And we need to uh, do this in um, uh, not only for lots of services, but we also actually have to do it from several points of view. We need to do it for the. Um, um, administrators, and we also need to do it for the users. And a sort of crude version of the basic idea is to take DevOps frameworks like Puppet and Chef, use those to um, define the components of your system, and then you build orchestration environments. Or actually, you don't even have to build them. They already exist. You use orchestration to combine those um, recipes. And as long as you specify things as a recipe, then you can enable them on general hardware. Um, OK, 
Okay, I'll, I'll continue. So this um, picture here shows, I mean, there is a standard picture which has software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. And um, this adds to this, uh, the, and this well-known concept, as I just mentioned, network as a service. And then it uh, joins us all together, and that then gives you your software-defined system as a service. As the system's going to end up as distributed, we're going to call this software-defined distributed system as a service. And we built this for a project called Future Grid. And the Future Grid needed to do two things, which I've already mentioned. Well, already mentioned. It needed to take the same hardware and bring it up either as um, cloud-based with OpenStack or eucalyptus or something, or bring it up as bare metal so that uh, users can compare the overheads of clouds. It also allowed, it needed to allow people to use this uh, hardware and uh, um, define what they're doing in a reproducible fashion. And so the one of the results of Future Grid, which is essentially a finished project, is this software called Cloud Mesh. And that's what I'll describe. And most of Cloud Mesh is not built by Future Grid. It's built by other people. There's a huge amount of open source, essentially nearly all open source software supporting these ideas. And so effectively, we're providing all of these four layers and their integration as a service. And uh, this has sort of implications we'll see on later slides that um, I, 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 you have things like image libraries, which are the libraries of the, of the um, um, software that you're going to run on every node, say of Azure or Amazon or what have you, or even of um, um, HPC cluster. As we're providing these things as a service, you do not at least in our system, you do not provide that as an image, except as a convenient performance enhancement. You provide it as a script which can create that image. So the libraries which enable users are a collection of scripts. Okay. All right, so here are some of the uh, features, many of which I've mentioned. Say it's essential, or at least it was essential for Future Grid to support virtualized and so called bare metal, non hypervisor based systems um, in a common fashion. Um, and um, so we had to actually support many different infrastructures of service um, frameworks because Future Grid ran Eucalyptus, OpenStack, Open Nebula and Nimbus as the virtual machine managers. Um, Future Grid also had about uh, six different clusters across the country, so we needed to um, integrate those together. Dennis at the back will notice that we're doing grid computing. Uh, it's really software-defined grids as a service. And he can ask me later why we can succeed, whereas I always tell him grids, grids didn't succeed. but. Um, Okay, so part of this is to allow users easier use of the system. Um, that's already mentioned, being able to manage experiments. An important one uh, feature, which we'll see in a later diagram, is you need to do monitoring to know measure performance and uh, things like that. Um, in this software-defined system, the monitoring is part of that system and the automatic recording of monitoring is part of the system. And um, everything is, the uh, basic framework is built around Python with IPython. Uh, workflow is actually defining the, uh, what's, what the system does and also that uh, IPython notebook effectively defining your reproducible experiment. 
and it has these various interfaces, programmatic, command line, and web, and as I mentioned, it has to satisfy users and administrators. So this, uh, this diagram is a layered diagram of these functionalities. I, I will just go through them in, um, in uh, no, it's not all of them, a lot of them. Notice we have network provisioning, that's software-defined networks. Uh, compute provisioning, that's where we get um, hypervisors and bare metal. Something we never really did much about, but in principle ought to be there, storage provisioning. Um, and we have above that both infrastructure platform and software as a service about platform. And there's some key features of this to make it work. You need to be able to manage the uh, systems, uh, the uh, use of the systems, which are called projects here, and the users. And so there is a sophisticated uh, database recording the properties of those things. Uh, this, but this is effectively a version of that diagram which gives you the various components of, uh, of Cloud Mesh. Uh, we have the virtual machine manager, the, auto, the provisioning, that's the um, um, dynamic uh, in, in instantiation of the uh, machine instances. And that provisioning has um, various usage models, some of which are called um, cloud bursting and cloud shifting. In cloud shifting, you take a job running on a, one of the one of the compute no, one of the clusters in Future Grid or one set of clusters, and you move them to another set of clusters. In cloud bursting, that's when you are using one system and you need to expand to a bigger system. Um, I mentioned why we needed to do experiment management. That's effectively what trying to do what Paul was describing, define experiments in a reproducible fashion. Uh, the two at the bottom, information server, well, near the bottom, accounting and information services, those are quite complicated because we needed, uh, as we were a part of the um, uh, US national um, infrastructure called uh, Exceed, we needed to record all the data, all the provenance of the runs in a way that was compatible with the uh, national standards. And so that's called cloud metrics. So this system automatically gathered metrics in a fashion compatible with the people who wanted our metrics. Um, the bottom is probably the most useful feature of cloud mesh, which is called the user on ramp. And this is sort of one of the models of future grid that you might develop your code on FutureGrid, which is a bunch of actually rather small machines, and then run them on another machine. So that's, that's an important model where software-defined systems are useful. You define your hardware, your software, and your hardware in an abstract fashion. You test it out on one piece of hardware, like you're testing it out on Azure today, and then tomorrow you turn around and run it on your um, supercomputer in the basement or something like that. Uh, so this allows you to use one system for um, testing and another system for deployment. And that's, that's called future grid or cloud mesh as an on-ramp. And that here mentions some of the systems we're compatible with. Amazon, so Future Grid itself, Exceed, which is this big national facility in the US, Open Cirrus, which is a, an old cloud um, system in the US, Exo, Exogenie is a, comes from the uh, networking community and is a distributed grid, and we have also have various other systems scattered around the world we can access. All right, so here is a bunch of buzzwords, which I will explain most of them. As I pointed out, this field, that means FutureGrid lasted five years, 
And we were using this type of approach for all of those five years, but our approach kept changing because the world kept changing because over those five years, lots of different pieces of software have been developed. And these are the software which we are using or probably will use or might use. I will actually define most of them. LibCloud, Cobbler, Celery. I won't define MongoDB. I think you know that's a well-known NoSQL database. That's where we store all our monitoring data. Um, we have, uh, we'll I'll define Chef and Puppet. Those are the uh, system definition languages. Open PBS and uh, Slurm are um, scheduling, and I'll define and I'll define other systems here. And there's ones at the bottom which we say we're evaluating. We're not actually using those. The, the ones below, the ones which says uses or accesses or implements, we're actually we're actually either using or soon will be using. So Cloud Mesh basically is a Python framework integrating these capabilities together. Possibly the most important is the Cobbler, which is the uh, dynamic provisioning system that allows us to instantiate on general, especially on bare metal, a general uh, system. Uh, LibCloud is a Python library which interacts with all these amazing uh, cloud and HPC systems. Uh, Celery is a particular task queuing system we use for implementing things. Uh, Heat is a orchestration engine for uh, OpenStack. Docker is very famous. It's growing in popularity. It's a Linux container system. Uh, sort of similar, slightly similar to a Chef and Puppet, but uh, building com um, containers. Akai is, comes from the Open Grid Forum, is a standard. And Slurm is a uh, scheduler, which is a good one to use within these general within these uh, software defined systems uh, so at the bottom of our system if you like is actually we tend to use chef but there are many systems like chef which are essentially to give you scripts they're called recipes for chef and puppies for puppet and those scripts define your component systems uh, now, the ones below um, are ones which we actually haven't really used or looked at. There's Razor, Juju, and Foreman, which are all in this same area. I put on the slide what they're doing. Um, they're doing provisioning in various ways. Uh, XCAT, um, Dennis had a nice system called XCAT, but this is a different XCAT. And uh, this comes from IBM. And it was actually the first system we used to do this in year one. Uh, we used XCAT extensively, and it actually took a couple of years to get it to work. But we don't use it now because it's rather specialized. It's not as broad as um, the other approaches. But other people tell us we should use XCAT, so we're still putting it on our list. So here are just a couple of uh, screenshots showing um, what you, you know tells you um, how to access clouds. HPC Rain is the actual instantiation. You rain us um, software on your uh, cloud hardware. Inventory is where you'll see all your um, image libraries. Um, although we, def as I mentioned, although we define everything with scripts. If you have to instantiate your software from a script every time, it's quite time consuming. And so we will and often keep the software already instantiated to save uh, um, deployment time. All right, so here's just a user interface. Here you can see you have what do we have here? We have about six different systems here. Sierra is a cluster at San Diego. HP must be at an HP cloud somewhere. Uh, there we have um, Amazon. We have India is the uh, future grid cluster at, um, at Indiana. HP East is another HP cloud. 
and a zur is a zur. So this is just gives you a menu from which you can choose your systems. And there we have, so that, those were the list of servers. Now you have the list of images. And finally, you have the list of types of images, big, little, long, things like that. And here we have this I, these IPython notebooks which allow you to um, either use Python or an ordinary shell script to invoke CloudMesh. CloudMesh is an open source project. You will find it. Um, just type FutureGrid CloudMesh at the world and you will find, find CloudMesh. Um, so this actually shows you what you have to do to make CloudMesh work. Um, and those things in blue are parts of the executing Cloud Mesh system. As I pointed out, most of these are built on top of other people's software. Um, the purple things at the bottom um, right are what you're creating. This is your software-defined uh, distributed system built in this case here as uh, four, uh, sli four slices of four different clusters. Um, in the middle, we have this image and template library. I pointed out we sometimes use templates or scripts and sometimes use images. It's a performance trade-off. Uh, on the left, you have the monitoring environment. Um, and at the top, we start off with this language, which doesn't really exist, called the software-defined uh, software distributed system language. I'll comment on that. Uh, we have a phase here which also, do, which is um, very um, ephemeral at the moment, a planning phase, but when you do um, general scheduling of systems, you usually start with a planning phase. We do not have that at the moment running. We do have what's called CM Prof here, Cloud Mesh Provisioning, that actually does the instantiation. And then we have the execution, the execution monitoring, which is going to provide things like um, uh, <coughs> The, the, the um, CM exec provides the monitoring and other types of capabilities. So that's the execution environment. So there, are, there is um, something we define. There, I there isn't actually, as far as I know, there is no agreed language for software-defined systems. There are many projects which effectively make such languages, of which uh, the one that seems to be the most defined is called Tosca, and it's an Oasis project. Um, there is a lot of work in the uh, Genie project in the US, which is the uh, big, big uh, next generation network project. And we take a sort of pragmatic attitude and essentially use Python as our language. And my argument for that is, if you look at what these, uh, this language has to specify, it has to specify the effectively how to uh, join things together, which is essentially what workflow or um, orchestration does. And my opinion is that those, the workflow languages, such as um, BPEL from Oasis have not been terribly successful. Workflow is hugely successful. I don't think the workflow languages have been successful. And so it's therefore not so obvious that the um, software-defined system languages will be successful because they're just trying to do the same type of thing. <coughs> and so it might, so we're trying to get away with us doing as little as possible in this area. I do not, I don't see it very much discussed. Tosca is not known at all in the US. And um, <coughs> it doesn't, so I think this is an area where further discussion is needed. Maybe the provenance uh, work can help us here. And so you will see in that sort of rather trivial example at the end, um, 
one natural thing that comes out of this is that if you're using Cloud Mesh as your Python interface for launching your system, you can then use that same Python to not only launch the system, but to act as a workflow scripting environment to control the system. So in this model, you effectively link workflow and dynamic provisioning together with the same Python environment doing both. And then so you get this uh, Python environment that does workflow and dynamic provisioning. And of course, there are many, I'm not an expert on the different ways Python is used in workflow, but there's certainly a lot, a lot of people do that. So the next two slides, which I think are the last, are very complicated. And they're actually meant to tell you, tell people that there are two important differences. And if you get them muddled up, you will think life is much harder than it really is. Um, so I mentioned bare metal provisioning. And um, bare metal provisioning sounds very dangerous. Here you have each, if we gave each of you bare metal provisioning on your supercomputer down, downstairs, I doubt if the uh, people will be very happy, the runners of the supercomputer will be very happy because it's sort of dangerous to give users bare metal access. Um, and so bare metal access for users is not so, so common. But however, bare metal access for administrators is very natural, because that's how administrators deal with systems anyway. So when we're talking about bare metal provisioning, typically we're not doing that. Almost never are we doing that at the user level. That's our system admins or our software team are doing the bare metal provisioning. Um, so the main purpose of this slide is to point out we do have bare metal provisioning. It is only available typically to people with very special privileges, such as system admins. Um, the other types of things that administrators would want to do as well as actually pro um, provisioning a system from um, bare metal up, they might want to uh, provision it from the hypervisor up. That's sort of what happens on commercial clouds. Or they might want to provision it at the platform level, which is sort of roughly how um, the national infrastructure running MPI and things is provisioned. Um, and so you, for, we have these three levels, hypervisor-based, bare metal, and uh, platform, and uh, an administrator could, in principle, want to do all of those. And here is the same, um, essentially the same levels for users. And we, you have to offer you a user bare metal access, because maybe that user is developing a new hypervisor or something like that. Maybe they're doing research which requires bare metal access. Um, but obviously, that user would have to have very strict uh, vetting and things like that. And uh, I forgot to stress that this system only works because there is attached to it a very, I think I mentioned this actually, a very strong user database and a project database where the project defines what the users can do. Uh, and so users, again, access at the hypervisor level what here is called platform or physical system level. That's sort of typically where m nearly all users of, say, supercomputers would access. And there's a very few of them who want to do the bare metal case. And actually, this is, I think, the last slide. So this tells you what type of um, hardware Cloud Mesh can use. So if I'm running Cloud Mesh, then the hardware I own is called the Nucleus Infrastructure. That's the hardware where I have total control, or the Cloud Mesh has total control and can do what it likes with. Uh, there is also things which are called federated infrastructures. If I was working with Microsoft using Azure, 
so that I, people might use my local OpenStack cloud to uh, do experimentation and then run a large system on Azure. Azure is a system which I can access with Cloud Mesh. Uh, I don't have the same ownership as um, I do with my own hardware because I have to pay for the use and things like that. So that's called federated infrastructure. And then the last type of infrastructure Cloud Mesh can do is essentially like Planet Lab or Boink or something like that, where particular users might add particular hardware dynamically to a system and register that hardware either for their own use or for particular selected people's use. So contributed infrastructure is characterized by often ha by typically having strong restrictions on its use, which has to be put into this database of projects, people, and infrastructure. So I, I, we've not used it in this mode, but at least that points out that you could do a Planet Lab-like model with this uh, type of system. Uh, all right, so that's the end of that uh, part of the uh, presentation. Are there any questions on that? I tried to show you how using largely open, generally available tools like Cobbler, Chef, and things, which are mo those two are open source. Not everything we use is open source, but most of it is, combined with um, the open source Python wrappers that we produce, you can actually uh, do a pretty powerful environment which allows um, um, producing software, defining it rather rigorously as, as services, and then instantiating those services on a broad infrastructure. Are there any questions on that? All right, so actually I forgot I had three more slides. These called PowerPoint the crash last time I used them. And these are just three student projects which were undergraduate projects done over the summer. One built a uh, resource reservation system for Cloud Mesh. You'll never be able to see this. This is one of these so-called posters which uh, have a, font, a tiny font size. If you make, and here is, so here is actually, at least you can see the idea of using Python as, a, as the invoking system and as the workflow. We, we built, uh, this student here built the um, um, workflow to allow one to do uh, a set of uh, biological um, big data computations which we were interested in. And uh, this one here, project management, I pointed out that this only works, Cloud Mesh only works if we um, think of the work in a very systematic fashion. This is one reason we can do here things that grids couldn't do. We're rather, we actually only allow you to do things which are defined very carefully with roles which you have to specify. And the project definition system we started with came from Future Grid, but we want to try to abstract it to make a general project management system. And that's again related to this idea of reproducible experiments, because the idea of a project on Future Grid was uh, an activity which did multiple experiments which were then recorded and published. Okay, I think I'm going to Well, I've already given you, so I now want, in this next um, few slides, I wanted to discuss the performance of the Apache Big Data software, because we've uh, tried to measure its performance in many, in many examples. Um, uh, I also, I also just wanted to start with uh, a few slides, uh, which I think I gave a brief part of in the first talk on comparing um, Simulation, um, simulations with big data problems. If you remember, I defined five big data architectures, and the first four of those architectures corresponded to the um, four versions of MapReduce, MapOnly, 
classic map produce, iterative map produce, or iterative map collective, I should say, and what I call map communication, which is classic MPI, and also, in fact, what's implemented by Giraffe in the Apache stack. So those four pictures up there give you a structure of communication which corresponds to uh, the, the big data applications that I described in the previous lecture yesterday. So if you want, I think I've mentioned some of these things qualitatively already, that um, if you look at uh, big data and compare it with simulation, both simulation when you do so-called parameter sweeps or big data when you're doing things like processing independent uh, observations, they both have that pleasingly parallel uh, um, category, which was the first of the architectures. <coughs> if, you <go> <coughs> if you look at the, uh, the next three architectures, both they typically bulk synchronous, both are actually bulk synchronous processing or s and single program multiple data. Uh, if you could go to um, big data, you often see streaming, uh, but that, that event, the streaming um, architecture is not terribly common in simulations, so that's an important difference for big data. Um, I, I mentioned that the, the second architecture, non-iterative MapReduce, the classic MapReduce, originally invented by uh, Jeffrey Dean at Google, that is not very common in um, simulations. In simulations, you almost always get iterations. There are a few simulations like Quantum Monte Carlo, which look like um, non-iterative MapReduce, because you're doing a computation followed by a reduction phase. Um, if we go to the um, third architecture, that's a very important big data problem with large collective communication. That's not, you again see some of that in um, simulation, in the sometimes simulation does do linear algebra, and linear algebra has this uh, architecture. But still, it's much more important in big data than it is in simulation. And Another key difference between simulation and big data is the simulation is almost, is nearly always sp uh, involves sparse data structures. That's because simulations typically come from um, taking uh, partial differential equations and discretizing them, and as soon as you discretize a partial differential equation, you will get a sparse matrix corresponding to the um, uh, the finite difference form of the differential operator. Even if you have uh, particle dynamics problems, lots of particles interacting with each other, <coughs> you go to Mother Nature. Mother Nature has its particles interacting typically with short distance forces. Or if they have a long distance force like the Coulomb force, it's rather well controlled. Um, so, there are a few sparse um, cases in big data, like the bag of words when you um, look at information retrieval, because then uh, a particular user, or the bag of items, a particular user only ranks a few items, so that's always sparse. But it's still um, not nearly as, that style is, that's a rather different style and it's pretty different. So when we do big data problems, we're looking at a very different types of um, connectivity structure. And that's true except for the one case I mentioned already, which is the giraffe case, which is shown here. All right, so here I put up two graphs. The one on the um, right is um, uh, Facebook. And the one on the left is um, chemic, a, a bunch of uh, chemic, chemical atoms and molecules linked to each other. And you can see both of these problems consist of entities linked together. In the case of Facebook, they're linked because you're friends or enemies of each other. And in the case of um, um, atoms and molecules, 
or fundamental particles, you are linked because you, or maybe even stars, you're linked because there is a force between those particles. And so there is a set of graph problems. That's why I say giraffe looks like MPI, because giraffe is doing the, uh, pro the type of problem on the right there, the social media problem. And there are a lot of very important type of uh, simulations which are doing this one on the, uh, on the left, which is the uh, particle, particle interactions. But, you know, the, if, you're, if you're a Facebook, uh, there are going to be probably some differences, which will mean that the graph in um, the particle case is actually easier to control than the graph in the Facebook case. Because when you have Facebook users, they have airplanes and phones they can use to transmit over long distances and you can get some uh, connectivity connections which are pretty, uh, uh, quite uh, erratic. Whereas particles usually have the property that the forces between them are only large when they're near each other. And so you get much more structured graphs from particles. But the actual uh, mathematics and the structure of the computing programs are the same for giraffe-based simulations, um, applications and particle dynamics. All right, let me make some, uh, a little bit of um, final remarks on performance of iterative MapReduce. And um, this actually was done, the first work was done on Azure with Dennis and a uh, student, Alina, who's actually working in industry now, and, and other people at uh, Judy Chu and Bing Jing Zhang from Indiana University. And the message of this, this work is quite simple. It is that um, <coughs> if you take um, these uh, iterative map reduced problems, you're doing a set of calculations, which are called the maps, and you're following it by the collective operations, which could be reductions or they could be other ones. And um, you will find that, um, not, it's not too surprising, but you can design those communication algorithms to run faster than the, the ones that are provided normally by the system. And so my student, Alina, um, produced a set of optimized communication algorithms for various applications running on Azure. And the other interesting thing is the optimization is not going to be the same on Azure as it is on a supercomputer, because they have different network topologies and different ways of implementing them. And so this is. Um, gives a world of what's sometimes called polyalgorithms, that you have an abstraction, like ma um, what do we have here? We have um, I, I find it, oh yeah, this has got all reduce. So this particular algorithm is using all reduce uh, as the dominant communication mechanism. Some of the others are scatter and gather operations. And so if you have the abstraction called all reduce, the programmer can just program all reduce because that's got a well-defined mathematical structure that you do a reduction and then at the end of the reduction all nodes uh, have the same result. That's what the all means. And if you look at the performance which runs up to uh, 256 cores, there is actually about a 30% difference in performance of the optimized algorithm compared to the one on the, these are four different uh, cl uh, cluster sizes and the um, graph on the bar on the right is the, is the default answer and the bar on the left is the, uh, is the optimized version. So actually the high performance computing community is very familiar with this idea and has been optimizing MPI. And in fact, I think I started working on this in early 1980, I wrote papers on how to optimize collective communication. So this is hardly a breakthrough idea, 
but I don't think it's so well understood in this uh, big data community that actually you can have good abstractions. You should give the abstraction names, and then you can implement those things in optimal fashions on different hardware. Well, this is the same um, idea, but applied to k-means. The other one was on another one called multidimensional scaling. And um, this has various um, optimized collective operations. And they actually are running both on um, Azure and on uh, clusters. And uh, again, you will find that the you can always get some speed up. And the, the speed up is of different sizes. And you can, and also we have different actual implementations of the collective. So you can find out which collective is the best one to use. Um, so anyway, I, my lesson from these graphs is let's decide on what the, um, let's agree to do um, collective operations or, point or other com communication patterns give names to those patterns so that we can define them independent of the hardware, and then we just get the, uh, um, um, the people who offer hardware to implement them in an optimal fashion. And that is true for Azure and also for Hadoop. The same thing here is just the same idea applied to Hadoop, not Azure. So I won't, let me, I'll move on to this concept here, which I mentioned already, called HARP. That's the latest way that uh, Judy Chu and her students are looking at this problem of um, how to put the optimal communication into, um, into Apache. So as I, I think I may have mentioned, we used to have a project called Twister. The student who built Twister is now working very hard for Microsoft. I think he's doing quite well. And uh, Twister has been a sort of a deprecated, pro is essentially has uh, fulfilled its mission, has shown people that you can iterative map produce is a good idea. And so we have replaced Twister. So we had to decide how to you know, take the, make the next generation Twister. And so the current idea is what's called Harp. And Harp is a plug-in to Hadoop. It is not, it has the same features as Twister. In fact, it is better done than Twister was. But rather than trying to build our own framework, we want to improve Hadoop. And so the I, this is, illustrates the idea of the uh, HPC Apache Big Data Stack, that we're not trying to replace Mahout as the library. We're trying to make Mahout run better by making, sorry, Mahout run better by making Hadoop, which is built on, run better. And we do that by you just building plugins. And so, So this is what, um, so this is a plug-in to Hadoop 1.2 or 2.2. And it, it, it actually builds in these concepts that we have of data abstractions, which have to be more than key value, uh, collective operations, which uh, we haven't built all of them yet, obviously. Uh, it actually supports both, it, if, if our theory is right, we will replace Giraffe as well as Hadoop because there is no reason, in my opinion, to have giraffe and a dupe, <coughs> because the only difference between roughly between giraffe and a dupe is the data abstraction. Giraffe supports um, the graph data abstraction, and the dupe supports the um, key value. Uh, so you, I don't see why you wouldn't just support both of them from the same system and offer two multiple data abstractions. Um, and it supports iteration. I don't know whether you can see these results. Well, you can probably see. So these are classic parallel computing efficiency results. And as far as, and this is actually, again, this multidimensional scaling problem, which is the one which probably stresses our systems the most. And this is going up to um, 4,000 cores on the supercomputer at, uh, at IU. This, um, 
This particular student spent the summer at Microsoft, so he wasn't able to <laughs> extend his work because this work is from last uh, sp the spring. And here you have efficiency as a function of uh, number of nodes. And um, you will see this, l this runs just like all parallel computing jobs should run. The blue is 100,000 points. The uh, red is 200,000 points. And the green is 300,000 points. And as you increase the size of the problem, the efficiency increases, which is what we're taught should always happen. And there's an obvious reason why this will happen, because for this problem class, iterative map produce here, a dupe, is running, is running with the same characteristics of, of all well done parallel, parallel programs. And parallel programs always run faster, when, nearly always run faster when you make them bigger, because the overheads of the parallel computing get larger as the problem gets smaller. And so as we make the problem bigger, we get better parallel performance. And so you can see we're running at 80% performance, which is a pretty good efficiency on 4,000 cores uh, for conjugate, the conjugate gradient algorithm in this, in this problem. So there's a lot more work to be done here, but it's a, the point of this, um, uh, these slides is that A, we need to do poly algorithms with to find collective operations. B, it appears to be quite sufficient to improve existing software and not introduce new software. And that we believe that you will get, I mean, we have other graphs which compare the performance of a do, of HARP with, uh, with MPI and things like that. And HARP is essentially the same, similar performance to MPI. In fact, there's a difficult to see graph here which shows that so this graph here has, uh, let's ignore Python. Python's obviously slow uh, because it's scripting, not, uh, not compiled. Um, so you have on this graph here Mahout. That is the worst. That's the sort of orangey thing, which is always near the top. Um, you ha so this is running k-means. And here you also have k-means running directly on a dupe. That's uh, not terribly good, but uh, somewhat faster than Mahout. You have uh, Spark, which is not too bad. That's the reddish thing. That's the uh, iterative map produced from Berkeley. You have Harp, which is always faster than Spark, but not quite as fast as MPI. Um, so this is a rather scruffy graph, which is not optimized and done in the most efficient fashion possible. but. Um, it illustrates that the, the um, MPI for k-means is very difficult to do better than the MPI because k-means is dominated by broadcasts, and we know MPI has very good broadcasts in it. HARP will get us is nearly M, near MPI and probably will be equal to MPI when optimized. Things like Spark, although it's a very famous uh, iterative map produce, is never going to perform as well as um, Spark or as MPI or HARP because it has the wrong communication primitives. Spark has not defined these, what I would view as correct communication primitives. It does not implement broadcast and, and re or reduce and think the ones we know we have to have. These, we know exactly what algorithms are needed for these problems because we've analyzed parallel, parallel computing from the beginning of time. But Spark is still going to be quite good because it's doing iteration. It's got that part right. It's just not got the optimized communication. It has a much more general. I mean, that's not really. I'm not trying to really criticize it. It's because Spark is aimed at a different type of problem, database type problem, and it has algorithms from that field. But those algorithms are never going to be competitive on machine learning with those that the HPC community had. So the it's I think it's pretty important to combine HPC with, with the Apache stack, because Apache has the functionality, but HPC has learned how to produce good performance and what you need to do to get that performance. So I think that's, uh, well, given the time, I will just <coughs> mention this concept here. I once had an idea which wasn't so successful called Java Grande. And now I, do, I just want to point out that it may be a, uh, 
it was pretty, when I, the, the idea of Java Grande was that all these um, simulation people were writing their codes in Fortran, why wouldn't they write them in Java? And uh, the answer is they wrote them in C++ and probably got even better performance than Java. But if you're building libraries for big data, there is so much, uh, there is so much uh, Java code around, it's sort of natural to try to produce good Java um, technologies. And um, so we have tried to, we've tried to measure the performance of Java. And at least today, the Java MPI is the same speed as the, the as um, C++ MPI, as long as you take the version which uses which, count, which is actually what Brian Carpenter and I built a long time ago, where you in, use uh, the Java native interface to import <laughs> the C++ MPI into Java. <coughs> if you do the pure Java version of MPI, it's not, it's not terribly high performance. It's, o it's, it's okay, but not great. It's slower, clearly slower. Uh, the other interesting feature about Java is there's no good implementation of OpenMP for Java. And so the only way we're able to use OpenMP like constructs is to work with Rice University who have something called Habanero Java. And so our results are gotten with Habanero Java and the version of Java MPI which is in OpenMPI which is from the, um, actually from, partly from Indiana University, Andrew Lumsdane. And the performance looks reasonable to us. And given the time, I won't go through them in detail. I will note just one strange graph, which is so strange. I, well, there's some graphs here I won't sh I'll, I'll put in the slides for you to look at. These are just measurements of MPI. And you will find MPI is, runs almost identically on C++ and Java. Here is a ridiculous graph, which I've told um, Dennis about. So this is running. C sharp on one machine versus Java on a different machine, and it is running it on various, um, running it up to 256 way parallel on um, different, um, different choices for the number of MPI processes and number of threads. And normally you get funny answers when your parallelism gets very high. For these plots, you get funny answers when the problem is running sequentially because the, one, the ones that run under Windows are incredibly slow when running sequentially. So if you look at this graph here, the Windows sequential code, which is run, takes 20 hours for a, well, the slow, it's not the sequential, it's the smallest one, is um, four times slower than Java. The machine is naturally actually points is about 30% uh, slower. If you look at the uh, most parallel code, uh, the, the difference between C sharp and Java is actually when you take into account the difference in the machines, they're actually um, running at about the same performance. So here you have the curious result that you get sensible performance at high parallelism and not so sensible at sequential or low parallelism. It's due to the fact Windows doesn't like large memory machines, large memory jobs. I will skip the next one on that one. That's similar characteristics. All right, so, so in this last set, I tried to point out that um, we can get good performance. I think we're gonna have as good performance on Apache big data stack with our uh, plug-in ideas as uh, anybody else as is possible to get. And that um, it seems to me pretty sensible to take this approach of not build, building yet another Apache project. People, in my opinion, we have far too many, we have plenty of Apache projects. Uh, we need to make sure make the ones we have already work fast. And I think it's clearly quite not too difficult to do that. Um, I, in the first part of the talk, I pointed out the concept of um, dynamic provisioning and defining services in an abstract fashion and then instantiating them on arbitrary environments. 
And the, when you did that, you could actually do these um, uh, experiments. You not only could then ma uh, manage your experiments, you could integrate the, that management with the workflow and um, get a reasonably interesting environment, which was cross-platform. And you can actually then run on supercomputers or clouds or what have you with the same uh, services. And then if you take this collective idea on your supercomputer, it will look at the topology and find the right communication primitives to use, and it will do the same thing on Azure. So the, the, I think the message is pretty positive. We know how to run with very high performance. We know how to define things abstractly. We can build these scripting interfaces, which go all the way from provisioning to execution. And it looks reasonably um, optimistic to me. Thank you.